Have you ever had the experience where you have a nagging health problem and keep inventing your own diagnosis? I have one piece of advice for you. Go to ZocDoc. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com slash something and download the ZocDoc app for free. ZocDoc.com slash something. Hello, I'm Blair Bathory, and this is the Something Scary Podcast. Thank you so much for being here, whether this is your first time or you're one of the brave souls who join us every week. Before we get started, I wanted to say thank you to all of our friends who have recently joined our Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and everything we do at Snarled, join our Patreon at patreon.com snarled. You'll get bonus content and you can chat with other horror fans on our members only Discord. And we'll even use your name in one of our upcoming stories. It's St. Patrick's Day this week, a day that commemorates the saint and the arrival of Christianity in Ireland. It celebrates the Irish luck that people feel because of the occasion. And while many of us count on our blessings and have moments of feeling lucky, There are those who seem absolutely cursed. Some people just can't catch a break and suffer through with a string of terrible luck. Is it just a coincidence? Or was there something done to anger the spirits? Either way, when death comes knocking, you better hope your luck hasn't run out. First, an unfortunate chain of events, followed by a fatal mistake. Then, everything is dying. Finally, in our featured story, death is calling. So, wanna hear something scary? Luck of the Dead. Chain letters have existed in one form or another for decades and have been used in many urban legends to elevate the fear of superstition. Whether old school snail mail or via your email inbox, the warning remains the same, as in this story written by Janine Pipe. Vicky looked at the email that had somehow wormed its way through her firewall and ended up in her main inbox. Not junk or spam, no phishing warnings, just there nonchalantly waiting to be opened. She'd been in a rush that morning, whizzing through her messages at top speed and not really paying attention to senders or subjects, which was how this particular message was now open and living rent-free on her screen. It started off in the usual banal way and wound up with, if you don't pass this on to 10 people within 24 hours, you must face the consequences and bad luck will follow you for eternity. There was also a bunch of small print However, the font was tiny and she wasn't wearing her contacts. The sender's address appeared utter gibberish and with the word Malshan Shu as the subject. Vicky presumed it was nothing more than a stupid hoax. It seemed an entirely pointless endeavor since there were no links to click on and have your life savings wiped away, but she wasn't going to risk forwarding it on and having her identity stolen. Delete. She didn't think much about it. School was pretty quiet and uneventful, which in and of itself was highly unusual. Even though they were moving towards springtime, it was still bitterly cold, and there were often a bunch of kids out with the flu. Rather than hang out after final period with some of the other seniors who were headed out for pizza, she headed home. A few hours later, she was scrolling through her Insta with her Maine Coon cat, Walter, asleep on her lap when she saw several posts from her friends. I don't believe it, she said out loud. One of her favorite NFL players, who was from their hometown, was back to visit and not only been to the pizzeria, but had insisted on paying for all of her friends' meals and taking a bunch of selfies. Still, she was happy for them, if not a little bummed out. She put down her phone and headed into the kitchen, much to Walter's annoyance. She spent ages chopping up bits of fruit and then whizzing them together in the blender to make a smoothie. 
heading back into the den with her drink, she picked up her cell and saw 10 missed calls and several texts from her mom. Reading through them, she quickly learned a coveted spot had opened up at the salon every senior had been trying to book for prom. She called them immediately, but of course, the appointment was taken. No, she cried, hanging up. She couldn't believe how unfair it was. If only she'd taken her cell into the kitchen. If only she hadn't made a smoothie and been using the noisy blender, then she would have heard it ring. She frowned, thinking about missing out on the free pizza and linebacker selfies earlier too. Why was she having such bad luck? Before she had time to pity herself, she thought back to that weird email from earlier. It had mentioned bad luck, hadn't it? She decided to head up to her room and look at the laptop again, bringing her cell and drink with her. Maybe it was because she was in a rush. Maybe because she wasn't wearing her contacts. Or maybe Walter just wanted attention. But as she was about to reach the top stair, he darted under her feet, causing her to trip. She lost her balance and because her hands were full, she wasn't able to grab anything for purchase. And so she toppled off the very top stair, twisted her ankle over and fell down the rest of them, hitting the cold, hard tile at the bottom with a sickening crack. Or maybe it was really bad luck. Just like if she'd fallen on any other day of the week her mom would have been home, but this was the one evening she worked late. Just like when her cell landed after also falling down the stairs, it fell just far enough away that she couldn't quite grasp it. She could only hear the ping, ping, ping alerting her to new emails. Emails forwarded from her friends with the word Malshan Shu as the subject the same email Vicky had deleted that morning. Vicky slowly died on the floor less than an hour before her mom came home and found her. The paramedics said that if they had arrived just an half an hour before, they might have been able to save her. It was just unfortunate luck. Have you ever received a chain letter or email? Did you forward it on? If not, did you experience any inexplicable bad luck afterwards? Have you ever had the experience where you have a nagging health problem and keep inventing your own diagnosis? Sometimes you can convince yourself it is nothing, but other times you literally give yourself an anxiety attack thinking about what it could be. I have one piece of advice for you. Stop and go to ZocDoc. You don't need to dream up scenarios any longer. Book an appointment with a few taps in their app and start feeling better, faster with ZocDoc. On ZocDoc, you can see real verified patient reviews to help find the right doctor in your network and in your neighborhood. ZocDoc is the only free app that lets you find and book doctors who are patient reviewed, take your insurance, and are available when you need them. Go to ZocDoc.com slash something and download the ZocDoc app for free. That's Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash something. ZocDoc.com slash something. Typically, as we get older, we get braver, but sometimes things from our childhood make us just as scared now as we were back then. Like in this story, inspired by Aaron. Kate had recently moved to a new town with her mom. The change was hard enough, but moving at the start of junior year was difficult. And to make matters even worse, the house was a fixer-upper and needed a lot of work. When they finally moved in, Kate's mom let her choose the room she wanted. Kate decided on the right one by the staircase. It was a decent size and had the biggest closet space. Her mom picked out the furniture from a secondhand store, all of it antique. One of the pieces was an old wooden vanity and mirror. Her mom put the vanity directly in front of Kate's bed. It was beautiful, but Kate hated it in her room. She was superstitious and read online that sleeping in front of a mirror was bad luck. It could potentially put you in danger since mirrors were seen as gateways or portals to the spirit world in some cultures. She asked her mom to move it to no avail. 
Apparently, this was the only way the furniture could fit into the room. Then she warned Kate about scaring herself with all those YouTube videos she watched. Eventually, Kate gave up asking, but she never really got used to it. The first few nights, Kate didn't get very much sleep. Every time she turned in her bed, she would get a glimpse of the mirror. It made her so uneasy. After a few weeks passed, she decided to talk to one of her new friends about it, who recommended just covering the mirror with a garment. Later that night, Kate grabbed a big blanket that her mom stored in her closet. She threw it on top of the mirror, making sure to cover all of it. Now she wouldn't have to feel so creeped out sleeping in front of it. And she would simply take the blanket off during the day. That way, her mom wouldn't fuss at her for messing with this antique or silly superstitions. That night, Kate had a much easier time falling asleep and kept this routine from then on. A couple of years later, Kate moved into her own place. When she started college, it was nearing the end of the semester and she was planning to go home for spring break. One day, when she sat working on assignments, her mom called to discuss plans. She was thrilled that Kate, her sister, and some other family would be home all at the same time. Oh, by the way, her mother said, I put one of those fake fireplaces in your room and put a TV on top of it. It's where that old antique vanity was. You know, the one you were freaked out by, her mom teased. Oh, really? Well, that's nice. It'll be good to have my own TV in that room, Kate said. She hadn't thought about that vanity in a while, but she was relieved that her mom had finally moved it. When she arrived home for break, she went straight up to her room to check out her new fireplace and TV. When she opened the door, however, she was dismayed by what she saw. While it was true that her mom had moved the vanity, she had failed to mention that it was now right next to the bed. Kate was horrified. The thought of that mirror being so close while she slept chilled her to the bone. She desperately wanted to confront her mom about it, but knew she would get nowhere. Kate took a deep breath and decided to do what she had always done, simply cover up the mirror. On that first night, Kate and the rest of the family ate a big dinner. They stayed up chatting and having a good time, despite being tired from traveling. By the time Kate finally went to bed, it was well past midnight. She was so exhausted that she completely forgot to cover up the mirror. Later that night, Kate was awakened by a sudden chill. The full moon was shining brightly in her room. She glanced at the clock, 3 a.m. Kate sat up in her bed, then suddenly got a glance of something off to her side. Oh no, Kate said, her voice shaking with fear, realizing the mirror was uncovered. Slowly, she turned her head to look at it. Everything seemed normal, except her reflection was smiling, and she wasn't. And then her reflection began to move on its own. Kate thought she had been dreaming, but before she could process any of it, her reflection had jumped out of the mirror, headed straight for her. She tried to scream, to move, to do something that would alert someone, but it was no use. She was paralyzed with fear. The reflection had become corporal and dragged her forcefully out of the bed and into the mirror. The next morning, when the aroma of French toast hadn't brought Kate downstairs, her mom decided to check on her. When she opened the door, she was surprised to find Kate not there. Her mom walked over to the bed, looking around in confusion. What she didn't see was her daughter on the other side of the mirror, desperately trying to get her attention. Mom, mom, Kate cried, banging on the mirror. Her eyes filled with tears as she realized her mother couldn't see or hear her. Kate watched hopelessly as her mother left the room, searching for her missing daughter. She was left alone, looking at the bed where she once lay. The realization sank in that she was trapped with no idea how to get back to the world on the other side of the mirror, the side where she belonged. Kate screamed and screamed knowing that she'd never be seen or heard ever again. And all because 
of the mirror she feared the most. What are the things you're superstitious about? Have you ever experienced something terrible when you didn't follow your instincts? If so, send us an email and tell us your story at somethingscary@snarled.com. Sometimes when people say something enough times, it eventually makes it come true. So be careful about putting bad energy into the universe. It will come back to kill you. Like in this story, inspired by Amelie. I'm not someone who is easily scared. I like things dark and twisted. Plus, I grew up visiting the most haunted place, my grandparents in Maryland. Yes, home of the Blair Witch Project in Burkittsville. But this tale takes place in Leonard Town, and it began back in 1697, the legend of Mal Dyer. Mal Dyer was an Irish immigrant who fled to the United States. She went missing for an entire winter, a brutal winter that followed what had been a terrible year. Then, on the first day of spring, a young local boy playing in the woods found Mal's body. It was frozen solid in a block of ice. He ran straight home to alert his mom of the discovery as fast as he could. His mom, Shauna, wept for her friend, but no one in town was surprised she was dead. In fact, some of them were happy. The trouble for Mal began earlier that fall. No one really knew her that well. She always kept to herself, living in a little shack on the outskirts of town. Because of this, there was a lot of gossip about her, even some unsubstantiated rumors that she was a witch. As a colorful old woman who knew a lot about herbs, Maul helped cure people who would come to her with her potions and remedies. Shauna had visited her many times and believed she did great work, good work. That winter, the town hit hard times. The weather was bitterly cold and the snow just wouldn't let up. The crops failed and livestock died. Disease spread and claimed many locals. Grieving, helpless and sad, the angry mob looked for someone to blame. They needed a scapegoat. And before long, it started to spread that Maul's witchcraft was raining down hell on the town. It was only four years after the Salem witch trials and people didn't trust the court system and were impatient. Determined to make someone hang for their heartache, the loudest, most vocal of the townspeople hatched a plan. One bitter night, they headed to Maul's home. Maul knew they were coming and she barricaded herself inside for protection. She never imagined they would be so cruel as to set her home on fire. Whether they wanted to smoke her out or simply kill her didn't matter. She had to run. Maul escaped and ran off into the wilderness. The mob didn't chase after her because they knew she had nowhere to go and it was inevitable. She would simply die in the freezing conditions. And they were right. When the townsfolk came to gawk at her corpse, they noticed she was frozen in a strange position. She was kneeled over a rock with one hand on it and the other stuck pointing to the sky. It was said her knees and hand left imprints in the rock. It seemed as if, in her last moments, she placed a curse. Shauna thought that was ridiculous. Maul wasn't a witch, just a poor old woman who died a horrible and unjustified death. But not long after her body was found, the mob's participants suffered serious misfortunes. Some lost their lands or their livestock. Within one year, all who were involved in setting the house on fire were dead and the lands Maul Dyer lived on and died on were left barren. In the centuries since her death, people have claimed to have seen the ghost of a woman wandering about, followed by lightning strikes and disastrous events. My grandpa took me to one road named after Maul that had been the site of a lot of tragic, random car crashes, some of which were fatal. Those who survived said that they saw a white dog suddenly appear on the road when the accidents happened. My grandpa also took me to see the rock Maul was found frozen on. 
It's perched right outside one of Leonard Town's historic buildings for everyone to visit. I touched it and instantly became lightheaded. I felt sick all day. Grandpa said it's because I was dehydrated and had too much sun, but apparently I'm not the only one that became lightheaded after touching that rock. Recently, the monument was fixed with a glass case over it. Some say to preserve it, but for those of us who felt its power, we know the truth. Have you ever experienced any type of curse? Are there places in your town that are said to be cursed? And how do you actually get rid of a curse that is following you? In our final story, join my co-host Stephanie as she tells the tale of the Doolahan, inspired by Emily Pearl and now animated over on our YouTube channel. We must always be mindful of the people we surround ourselves with. Sometimes the people who seem craziest are actually telling the truth. And even those who care the most about us won't always be around to protect us when we need it the most. Myra was looking forward to her trip to Ireland. It had been several years since she had last seen her grandmother, Kathleen. It was also her grandmother's pleasure to see her granddaughter and to give her a family heirloom, a beautiful gold cross necklace. Her grandmother promised it would bring her good luck and more importantly, protect her. Although not typically superstitious, Myra was deeply moved by her grandmother's gift. After lunch, Fiona, an old childhood friend of Myra's, invited her to have dinner in town. Her grandmother told her that she could go as long as she wore her new necklace. As Myra was finishing up her makeup, Fiona pulled into the driveway and honked her horn. Myra was in such a rush, she completely forgot the necklace, which lay on the dresser. At the restaurant, Myra and Fiona were laughing and having a good time when an old man stumbled into the restaurant screaming, it was him, I saw him. The old man was frightened, his eyes wide and bloodshot. He was panting and his face was white as if he had seen a ghost. He called my name, the man cried. My name, I'm a dead man walking. There was this frightened look on Myra's face and Fiona told Myra not to listen to crazy old Tom, but still, Myra felt as if she wasn't being told everything. Midnight came and Myra was anxious to get home, but Fiona wasn't ready to leave. Myra decided that walking home would be good for her. So she headed down the old dirt road through the woods. She knew the path well, but it felt much different in the dark. There was a deadly silence among the trees whose shadows stretch out like twisted, thin hands above her. Suddenly, a sound pierced the silence. It sounded like horse hooves. She heard it again. It was coming from right behind her. She turned, and there in the shadow stood a large black horse. Mounted on top was the tall figure of a mysterious rider holding something. It was too dark for Myra to make out. The horse just stood there, not moving an inch. She came under attack as it reared up and galloped toward her. Myra ran for her life so hard that her lungs were on fire. She could hear the horse snorting, its thunderous hooves pounding the earth beneath its powerful legs. Myra tripped over her own feet, falling to the ground. She curled up in a ball, preparing to be trampled to death. But the horse walked straight past her. As it did, she clearly heard her name. The rider called in a deep, hollow voice. Myra looked up, but they had disappeared, and all was quiet once again. Finally arriving at her grandmother's house, Myra's cell phone buzzed. Her eyes went wide. The text was from Fiona. Old Tom had been found dead outside of his house, apparently from natural causes. What a strange and terrible night. Opening the door with shivering hands, she immediately woke her grandmother, telling her everything. And a glimmer of fear filled Kathleen's eyes as she was told about the mysterious writer. 
Did he see you? Did he call your name? She asked in a shaking voice. Yes, how did you know that? Myra thought. Kathleen's entire body tensed as she faced Myra and said, That's impossible. How could he call your name? You were wearing your... Kathleen's words stuck in her throat as she looked at Myra's bare neck. The chain was still on the dresser. Kathleen's voice trembled. The writer you saw tonight was the Dolahan, an ancient Irish fairy who carries his head in his hands. He's a harbinger of death. He rides at night searching for victims. If he passes you and calls your name, you're, you're called to, to death. Initially, Myra wasn't sure she could believe what she was hearing, but then she remembered something and she felt her blood run cold. It was the flashback of Tom mentioning someone had called his name. Kathleen started sobbing. Gold repels the Dolahan. He won't go near anyone wearing it. I'll go put it on right now, Myra cried. But before she could leave the room, something pounded the door. She and her grandmother clutched onto each other as it blew wide open. Standing in the opening was something more demon than man. He had a muscular frame with a long, tattered cloak rippling in the breeze all around him. His broad shoulders did not support his head. Rather, it was clutched in his right hand. Deathly pale, its eyes were hollow. Sunken orbs of pure black, rows of needle-sharp teeth poking through thin, bloodless lips. The dark nightmare rose his arm, holding the head out so the eyes were facing them. With a voice like gravel, it said, The screams of Myra echoed through Kathleen's head as she stood helpless and powerless to protect her loved one. Myra's name had been called and she had failed to wear the protective heirloom. Now all Kathleen could do was watch. The next morning, Fiona and her grandmother came to visit Myra and Kathleen. They found the door wide open. Myra's corpse lay sprawled out on the floor. A traumatized Kathleen sat near, clutching her knees to her chest, rocking back and forth. It was a Dolahan. It was a Dolahan. Along with old Tom, a teenage boy, an elderly woman, and a young man, Myra's body was taken to the corner. If outsiders were to look at the corpses of the unfortunate souls, they would think that they had simply died of natural causes. However, the locals knew better. They knew it all too well. The Dolanhan would be back, and he would be looking for more unlucky souls to reap. This week's podcast stories were edited by Sarah Lukasiewicz, Janine Pipe, and Stephanie Strange. Narration by Blair Bathory and Stephanie Strange. Audio edited and mixed by Calvin Linderman. Additional audio editing by Fitz Harris. Art and graphics by Irma Richardson. Produced by Anna Villalobos. Executive produced by Gail Gilman. Music by Sapphire Sindalo and Calvin Linderman. <laughs>